before we have our next, um, not, not panel session, but on stage conversation, I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Norman Crowley, um, who's going to speak next. Uh, uh, Norman is from uh, Crowley Carbon, um, and I've been looking at your background. It's, it's kind of interesting. You, you, you started out uh, by co-founding the Inspired Gaming Group with uh, eight other people, um, which uh, I didn't know about this, but this is, this is the largest player in the world of area-based, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, the largest player in the world in the area of server-based gaming. And... Um, digital slot machines. Di digital slot <laughs> machines. Um, and then Norman <laughs> co-founded the cloud, which uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure uh, often pops up on our, on our mobile devices. Um, um, but... Uh, most importantly, he, he founded Crowley Carbon in 2009, which focuses on reducing energy consumption uh, amongst large industrial and um, commercial companies. So, uh, Norman, thanks. over to you. Hi. Don't worry, this isn't an ad, ad for our company, by the way. Um, so, a bit of my background. Um, you might hear from my accent that I'm Irish. Um, I grew up in a farm in West Cork, um, and I trained as a welder. So uh, very jealous of all the professors and doctors uh, here. Um, I set up my first business when I was 17. Um, I sold them when I was 21. I've sold three companies, The Cloud, um, Inspired Gaming, and another one called Trinity Commerce. Um, and I guess in 2008, I had the, the joy of selling the last one, Inspired Gaming, for about a half a billion dollars. Um, if you're wondering what happens when you sell a business for half a billion dollars, what would you do? Then you take two weeks off in Portugal and you start your next company. Um, <laughs> and when you do a startup, the thing I've learned is that uh, you're kind of signing up for eight to ten years of your life. Um, and it can be quite traumatic, invariably it is a bit traumatic. Um, and so in setting up a business in 2009, I guess we wanted to do something that was going to make money but also have an impact. And so in Crowley Carbon, rule number one, make money. Rule number two, make an impact. Um, don't do number two without number one. Don't do number one without number two. And so um, and climate change was the thing we settled on. And, and I, I haven't looked back. I think climate change is the thing that we're very happy to be in this space. It's, a, it's an interesting one. Fascinated with the discussions already this morning. A um, bit about us. Is the clicker working? Yes. So we're an industrial and large uh, commercial energy efficiency company. So large commercial for us is big, tall buildings. We have a business in the Middle East. Our most famous client in the Middle East is the Burj Khalifa, tallest building in the world. Um, and we have lots of other fancy clients. Um, we, um, we mainly focus on food and beverage and pharmaceutical and the manufacturing side. The slide is a bit old. It's a copy of one. Uh, up until the beginning of 2015, uh, we delivered 45 million euros of savings. Um, I pulled the number just before I came over. It was 62 million in savings. It's gone up to now. Um, we'll have to update that. We know a lot about heating uh, stuff and cooling stuff because in the world of energy efficiency and in the world of cooling the planet, then it's all about making heating stuff and cooling stuff more economical. Um, the next couple of next two slides are interesting, right? So we guarantee the savings when we do a project for a client, and we're backed by Munich Re on that. So if we miss the savings number, then our client can just save off their insurance. Um, the other interesting thing is about 60% of the projects that we do are financed, and that's even with some very rich companies. So we, for instance, we finance GE's uh, energy efficiency projects, which is kind of funny. Um, and also we finance Johnson & Johnson. So we finance some some projects for some very cash-rich people. And there's an interesting thing about this, those two statements, right? And there's a number of professors of economics in the room. So here's the thing, right? So we can do a project for a client um, with, on average, about a two and a half to three year payback, okay? So what's that as a return on capital, roughly, if I put it into the bank? Anyone brave enough to try that out? <laughs> it's about 33%, right? Uh, or is it, it's, it's between 33 and 40%, right? And we have a backlog of banks who want to work with us. We've got about 400 million euros at our disposal at the moment that we can invest. And we get that on average at about a 5% return, right? So if you're 
our client, we can get you the money at 5%, yeah, you're getting a 33 to 40% return, and if anything goes wrong, it's insured, right? And yet, of the pitches we do every week, yeah, only about 10% of people agree to do a project with us, yeah? So, and when I stare into space at night, right, that's what I wonder. I kind of go, what the hell is wrong, right? And when we talk about climate problems and that, when a sophisticated business won't do the obvious, and then we're asking loads of people to do the complex, then we still have a problem, right? Um, so you're nobody in business unless you have a slide like this, right? <laughs> We've gone so lazy now, right? We haven't even updated it in about two years. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have a rude word for this, so I'm not gonna share it with you. So, so my thoughts on this whole thing, <clears throat> it's getting very serious, yeah. So I've lived and looked at climate change since looking at Inconvenient Truth, which is probably out 15 years at this stage. And I remember reading some of the early scary stuff and they said, and if it goes really, really bad, yeah, it, this could happen, you know? And now you read in a newspaper, oh, this just happened, right? But you're normally only reading it in The Guardian, you're not reading it in, in where a lot of people read, right? So it's very, very scary. Every day now, 110 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. Yeah. Um, the 14 of the 15 hottest years on record are in this century, and we're only in 2016, and 16 is not finished yet, so we can't be counting that, right? So that's pretty scary. And then one of the ones that I'm sure you were all emotionally drawn to, like I was, was um, According to the UN, by 2050, we'll have 200 million climate migrants, right? Um, and all we read about at the moment in Europe is Syrians and those terrible photographs of a baby on the side of the sea, right? That's a couple hundred thousand, right? What are we going to do with 200 million? Yeah. So a lot of the numbers in this space are scary. And we talked about it earlier, almost everybody is ignoring it. Like you're all here today at a climate conference, so you're not ignoring it, but almost everybody is. And we talk to corporations every day of the week and the vast, mass majority of them don't care, don't believe it's true. You know, there's way more people that we talk to don't believe it's true than are in the statistics. Um, governments aren't fixing it. Yeah, they're just not. Um, we've been in this business now uh, nearly seven years and government is an annoyance. Um, rather than anything else, yeah. They offer a subsidy, all our customers get excited, then they pull the subsidy, then they change the subsidy, and it's the perfect excuse to do nothing, actually. Um, so, because we're, oh, we're about to make an investment and then the government changed their minds. Or we're about to make an investment and actually the government mooted something about a subsidy that might be happening next year, and therefore, we'll wait, yeah. So, this consistency of policy thing drives us crazy, yeah. Um, and so, we are, we are very down on government when it comes to climate change. And there's no mystery as to why that is, right? Because you're asking a body of people who get changed every five years to solve a 50-year problem, right? So big surprise, yeah. So, and the one that we've talked about already, and I didn't change this slide um, <laughs> during, the, during the coffee break, the thing that we see that's consistent is technology is making it better, yeah. Um, has anyone here seen this documentary on Netflix, Cowspiracy? Yeah? Yeah, not as many. So the rest of you should watch it, actually. Uh, as a lifelong carnivore, I'm, I'm slowly tur turning vegetarian. But I was, um, Cowspiracy is a very scary movie. It's on a par with um, An Inconvenient Truth, and it talks about meat and methane and greenhouse gases and, and how impossible this problem is. And, um, and after watching it, I, I googled something that I'd heard about before, which is Beyond Meat. Has anyone heard of Beyond Meat? Um, so it's Bill Gates has invested in, in it. And um, it's interesting. So if you think about cowspiracy and all that, we're eating more and more meat, there's more and more methane, we're eating up more and more of the planet's resources doing it. All the developing countries want to eat more meat. And it looks like it's never going to end as a problem, right? Um, and then you look at technology again, right? And you look at Beyond Meat, and what they've done is they've figured out what meat's made out of, and then they've got plants and made it look like meat. And your immediate reaction is, I'm sure it's horrible, but actually I've tried it. It's in Whole Foods, and it's actually really good. You know, and if somebody said, you, you have to have this for the rest of your life rather than meat, you know, I'd be upset for five minutes and then I'd get over it, yeah? So technology <laughs> is, has a huge part to play. Um, you all saw with Tesla's new model, 400,000 orders, so, and all the, all the competitors are laughing at them for years, right? Um, and yet, 
here it comes, 400,000 orders for a new car. And so from our point of view, where technology plays in, a, in efficiency, so when we started off doing energy efficiency with corporations, we used to think that they wasted 20% of the energy that they consume and water. Um, but now, having worked with them for a lot of years, the statistic, and this is across 400 projects that we've done with some of the biggest companies in the world, corporations are wasting 50% of the energy that they use. Yeah. And I will argue that number all day long. And when they invest money on it, like we said, they get about a 35% investment. And yet, probably 10% you know, of the activity that's happening is actually happening, probably less. Yeah. Just to tell you about some of the innovations that we have, since this is about harnessing innovation, this sexy looking box, it's better in the video actually, <laughs> is thermal server. We have about 200 megawatts of thermal server installed in, in Europe. Um, this is the oil consumption when you install, does that white thing act as a laser? Oh, no, it doesn't. Um, this is the oil consumption on a food plant when they put in thermal server. Um, so that specific one is Linden Meats, 92% reduction in oil consumption from thermal server. Yeah. Um, this is Synergy, it's an application we have, it's mainly a control application for controlling chilling, and chilling is one of the biggest energy users in the world and it's rising like crazy. So it's an amazing statistic that the demand for chilling in Europe is gonna rise by 75% between now and 2050. Um, there's energy consumption from a pharmaceutical plant using Synergy, 62%. This one is a plastics factory in Spain. Um, I think that's about an 80% reduction. Um, there's another one. So, and then one of the coolest things that we've made in the last couple of years is, if you think about your house, right? And you all left this morning and you may or may not have forgot to switch the heating off or if you're really fancy, you have a nest and it automatically did it, right? But last time you forgot to switch, or those of you who have teenage kids like I do, they keep forgetting to switch the lights off, right? But if you imagine a factory, well, first of all, if you imagine your house, right, you forgot to switch the lights off, what happened, right? Nothing, you just kind of went, oh, forgot to switch them off, right? If you imagine you've got a factory or you've got a building in Dubai, and in Dubai, you've got eight 20 megawatt chillers that use about $4 million a year in energy, yeah? So what happens if you forget to switch one of those off, right? And the answer is the same thing that happens in your house, right? Nothing, they just sit there and they chug away, right? Um, and one of my guys, one of our top fridge engineers, I've always watched him do this. He walks into a fridge plant room, right, where you have compressors, and they're all chewing energy, right? And what he does, and it's fascinating to watch this, he goes over and say there's eight of them, right? He'll go into the plant and he'll switch six of them off. Right? Just walk over to the over, over, right? Bang, 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 bang. And then he just watches all the dials. And amazingly enough, the factory keeps running, right? <laughs> Uh, in Dubai, we just finished a project in a place called Marina 6, six 70-story towers, right? They got from using five chillers to one chiller, and nobody's noticed, yeah. So th the opportunity around chilling is huge, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't very subtle, was it? <laughs> you said you were going to wave, not all up a side. <laughs> That's three minutes left, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll be fine. <laughs> so the, what our software does, which is very exciting, is when you do something you're not supposed to do, or when a machine does something it's not supposed to do, then what the software does is it goes, I saw that, yeah. And it records how much money you're losing as that's happening. And then it's even worse than that, right? So at the end of the day, it sends you an email saying, here's the things you did wrong today. And it's quite technical, so it says, you, you know, you forgot to switch it off, or it might say, please adjust the discharge pressure from 10 down to 9.2. It's quite sophisticated, right? But here's the sneaky thing it does, right, in, in the organizations that have it. It'll email you, and then at the end of the week, it'll email your boss, and then at the end of the month, it emails the CFO, and then at the end of the quarter, it emails the CEO, right? And there's a lot of the big companies in the UK have it now, and it's fascinating, because the odd time we get an email that we happen to be CC'd on, and it's from the boss, and he's just going, what does this mean, right? <laughs> like, why am I losing this money? Why didn't you do that, that you were supposed to do? And so it's a very exciting um, technology because you can't hide anymore, right? It's, what it's doing all the time is it's just putting a price tag of your, your mistake in front of you and hoping that you'll fix it by doing that, yeah? Um, and, and it is revolutionary and we're very excited about it. Here's an example, actually. This is called a spark and this is what the engineer gets. This one says, hey, you left the vacuum pumps on last night. 
And then he says, well, I was in production last night. No, you weren't, because we know your low temperature fridge was off, so you weren't producing. You just forgot to switch them off, right? Now, this one is small, right? 73 pounds, you left it on for 14 hours. But these things are having this amazing effect where people go, well, why did you do that? Can you not do that again? We had one a couple of weeks ago in a brewery, and it was 7,000 pounds an hour, yeah? And it was running all weekend. So these things are having a big effect. And we have applications that span a whole load of different things, heating, cooling, processes, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. What we have in Dublin, um, you know, you're nobody as well unless you have a knock, right? Big screens, all that kind of thing. Uh, what we have in Dublin is these guys are watching about 400 factories around the world. And if something gets so serious and is losing so much money, then they'll actually pick up the phone and harass somebody into fixing it. Yeah. So it's very innovative. We haven't seen anything like it anywhere. So the final thing is, um, we're now at a point where, and I get very, you know, you're, we were talking earlier about optimism and pessimism, and, and I'm optimistic about this, um, again, sprinkled with um, points of deep depression about it. But one of the things that we've started doing lately, and I had a fascinating discussion with RWE, one of the big German utilities, about this recently. <laughs> and I'll finish with this one, right? So we had a meeting. And they were finding out what we do because we were working on projects in Poland and Germany. And, um, and we showed them technology and they thought that was really cool, right? And then in the end, we talked to them about this, right? Which is we said, we're working at a lot of companies right now in countries where there's no incentive for solar or any kind of renewables. So there's absolutely no government incentive whatsoever, right? And we said, here's the deal. If the plant's bill is a million euros, we're going to take 33 to 40% of it out with energy efficiency. And they were kind of going, yeah, we're, see we're seeing that we buy that number. And then in the case of food production, we're going to put in anaerobic digestion. That's going to be another 20%. And then we're going to, all these food companies seem to have a lot of land around them. So we're going to put in two acres of solar, and we're going to put some solar on the roof. Right? And the net result of all that is we're going to obliterate 92% of their bill. Yeah. And the utility guys were going, that's, that's very noble of you. And we were like, screw noble. Right? <laughs> we said, let me take you through the numbers. Right? It's very simple. So, the company was paying a million euros on the ener their energy bill. After they paid for the financing and all the stuff, right, their reduction on energy is 350 grand a year off current energy prices with low oil and low electricity and all that. Yeah? And, then, and they said, yeah, but like, the money came from some benevolent person. Right? And we said, the money is making 25%. Yeah? And they were going, without subsidies. Right? So that was with the CEO. And the funniest meeting happened. About a week later, 10 of them came in with the CEO again. It was, it was a couple of weeks later. And I love the CEO's line. He shook hands. Everyone had some tea. And then he said, tell them what you told me. <laughs> because, and then he said in the end, maybe that's why 160 billion euros has been wiped off utilities in Europe in the last couple of years. Yeah. So this is coming. And these are reasons to be optimistic. right? Um, but it is still very frustrating. And final slide. From our point of view, energy is not expensive enough, right? It's not. When you buy coal, you should have to pay for the carbon that came with that coal. That's number one problem, yeah? It's not hitting us hard enough, which sounds like a real scary thing, right? But we were talking about earlier. We are psychologically predisposed to see a tiger coming towards us and reacting. We're not psychologically predisposed to see something 50 years from now coming towards us. But sadly, by the time the fifth superstorm hits us, and by the way, the last one was seven times stronger than the one before. We'll know all about it. Yeah. And sadly, the only way we're going to react is with that. Uh, the last one, that's never going to change in my view. So, yeah. Thanks, Robert.